get booked as a speaker? You may say, me? (laughs) Yes, you. If you're talking on video, you're going live to connect with an audience. Hopefully, you've learned the parts of a good story and you're telling it, not just telling facts, not just saying drink eight glasses of water a day, but you're really telling a story that pulls them in. And that whole thing applies to a podcast. If you know how to get attention and keep attention, you're ready to give a presentation. Shall we call it a speech? It can be a five minute, 15 minute. It can be an hour. That's a really long time to speak, by the way, in front of a smaller, a big audience. Or maybe you're hosting your own two hour masterclass or webinar or workshop. That is all speaking. And there are so many ways, but rather than being talking here about you hosting your own opportunity, like you hosting a podcast, you hosting a masterclass or a workshop in order to give yourself a platform to speak, consider how much speaking for someone else and getting booked as a speaker could move the needle forward in your business. It's going to give you tons of exposure. So whether you do a podcast with someone else, for instance, the Flipping 50 podcast, or you come on and talk here about how you built your business, how you thought it was going to go and how it's really going, even that establishes your credibility. Or you're doing a training within a company, and I'm going to give you a lot of ideas here. Maybe you're the opening keynote for their company business meeting or a retreat, or you're doing a keynote for an association or organizations that are even on the small side, but you know, a women's group for a church may put you in front of 25 to 50 women. It's an awesome way to establish credibility, but even better exposure to a large pool of people who need your services. I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to She Means Fitness Business. It's our podcast that is a division of Voice for Fitness. And at Voice for Fitness, we know that you want to be an inspirational example to midlife women. And in order to do that, you need a profitable health and fitness coaching business. And the problem is a lack of clients or a lack of revenue because you may not be charging enough which makes you feel uncertain about whether you can succeed, you start losing confidence. Look, we believe you deserve consistent, dependable revenue from clients you love working with. And I understand how this place you're in feels, because I've been there too, which is why I now train fitness pros internationally. Here's how we do it. I meet with you on a call. We create together a plan of action And we celebrate your growth, all the little baby steps that are going to start happening from taking action and the benchmarks along the way that tell us we're on the way to the bigger transformation you really want. So book a call now. But first, in the meantime, get your business scorecard and the link to that is in the show notes so you can stop feeling like your dream is slipping away while you watch other less qualified, less heart-centered coaches make sales and get more clients. And instead, you can easily increase your revenue by at least 5,000 a month in 90 days. Or if that's already a number that is less than you want it to be, you can probably increase by 25% and hope to double your business within a year. Let's dive into this because speaking is such a big deal. And in other podcasts I've shared with you, here's how to grow your business. Here's how to get publicity. Even if you don't have the budget to hire a PR company, here's how to put that hat on. We'll put those in the show notes as well. But here, here's what I want you to know. Number one, what's the title of this podcast? Seven Ideas to Get Booked as a Speaker. Why Seven Ideas? Okay, pay close attention because this is really meta. The title is designed to get your attention. And every presentation you give should be just the same. It's not much different than having a subject line that gets people to open your email or having a blog post or podcast title that gets them to say, I have to listen to that because I want that. I need that. So 
there's dozens of podcasts, dozens of music you could be listening to right now. And just like in our coaching world, when we're up against the famous names, the niche experts and the masters of the industry, you have to find something that gets noticed. My title likely grabbed your attention and I'm hoping for my ideas that they do too. Think about how you can grab your prospects' attention. Super important for you. Okay, number one, are you ready? Buckle your seatbelt. Circle of 100, however, start with 25. What I mean by circle of 100 is ultimately every good professional has a network of people they refer to. I mean, we can't solve all the problems of the world that every customer we work with has, right? So if you really niche and you're providing the exercise for women in menopause, you don't necessarily also provide the best nutrition advice. You might provide superficial level, like here's basics. And if they're struggling with that, not getting support that they need from that they probably want to go out elsewhere. So you want to have a dietitian. You want to have functional nutritionist in your network. You also can't prescribe, right? And you may feel comfortable, but only to a level, interpreting lab tests that someone does. So whether you do or you don't, and you can talk to and educate your clients on lab tests, and you should. And you need to know, you and I can order our own lab test. It's called self-directed. Been able to do that for a decade. We can order them and you can look at how to interpret them. It is always going to come down to though, if you need a prescription or you're on prescriptions and you're thinking you're going to take something else, you have to know what's the interaction. And that's where you still may need to go to a functional doctor, but then you actually know, do I need to? If you're not taking any medication, any over-the-counter, and there's not going to be any interaction, you may be able to proceed with you know, the addition of consideration of some herbs and adaptogens and lifestyle changes that you could go forward with. But what I want to point out here is the need for a network. People who do things or pick up the ball where you can only go so far in certain areas. Now, if you want to know about lunges and you want to know why they're great and you want to know how to make modifications or create substitutions, you may be that exercise expert. You can go there all day long and and no functional doctor should be doing that, right? Because they don't actually know, even if they work out and do lunges, they shouldn't be giving that advice. But just because we eat doesn't make us a nutritionist. Just because we sleep doesn't make us a sleep expert. Just because one thing worked for you or I doesn't mean we give that to everybody that we work with. So have that team. Start with a list of 25 people knowing. My goal is to actually have 100 people that are in my network. And what's happening and magically about that is you refer to them, they should refer to you. And it's it's a great relationship. And if it's not, you find another expert who you do trust and love. And likewise with they. Ultimately, that 100 is what you want. Family counts when you're starting, but only if they have a connection with an organization that could benefit from your work. Maybe they are part of an uh, uh, organization. Maybe they're a teacher and the teachers at the school um, or PTA could actually put you in front of an audience. Okay, great. So go through everyone and know not everybody is a great person. So you know, there's lots of examples about, you know, somebody I knew. And so somebody um, that was in industry and it was fantastic, but if he couldn't put me in front of an audience, mm, no longer. So my brother-in-law and yes, I only have one sister, so there's only one. So my brother-in-law used to be a pilot and he, uh, ran a business. So he ran a family owned business. He inherited, he and his sister ran it after their father passed away. And, you know, in terms of who who could he put me in front of, you know, probably I was not going to get into any pilots association or uh, behind the scenes in the airlines for Continental or United, depending on what it was. But Could I have spoken to his company and people in his company? Probably so, but he is now, they've sold it. And 
So he's no longer on my list. So I mean, dig in, really look specifically at who and why and why we would reach out to him. Okay. So let that circle know what you're currently doing in your career. Ask them to help you identify organizations or groups even that might benefit from your work. You know, a lot of women who are friends of yours may belong to groups, not just that you two have in common, but that you're not in. And I've mentioned this in the past, but there is a women's organization called PEO. I can't tell you what that stands for. I have to kill you. But it's basically a women's philanthropic organization. And, you know, in the uh, town, the college town of about 50,000 that I lived in for about 30 years, there were 14 different PEO groups and divisions alone. Now, over the course of that 30 years, I probably spoke in front of 10 out of 14 of them and some of them more than once because I did a good job and I got asked back. But what's important about that is don't discount anybody right away, right? So that may open the door and maybe there was only 25 people in each of those groups and sometimes less at a time, but women talk. So is it a valuable, you know, um, they took away things that they were still talking about into the week with their friends. They were telling other people. So don't discount anything that is a potential for you to talk in front of a group that is your ideal customer. That has to be also a part of the deal. So for this to, gener to generate business has to have several components. So make sure that the letter you send out has these things. It may be a template that you create about what you're doing, getting in touch, how you can serve, who you help, how you do it, how you solve the biggest problem. But the, the middle paragraph specifically is written for the addressee. And by the way, first paragraph is not about you, you, you. It's about the problem that you solve, what you've been noticing, asking questions, getting them curious about, yes, this is me, or this is a lot of people I know. Tell me more, okay? Okay. Be clear about what you offer and and don't have a dozen options. So get it clear. You may have levels of one thing, but it's probably A, B, and C. Like it's this, it's this plus this, and it's this plus plus this. Super simple. Clear. Make your offers just like that. Call to action on their part. Ask for what you want. Is it that you'd love an introduction via email to someone who's in charge of a group? If you'd love them to email back and say, I have these suggestions for you. I think these might be a good fit. Those are important things. And end it would, would you be so kind as to pass on my name? And again, get specific. Like I'd love uh, an email introduction. A database, everybody, not just your decision makers, meaning start creating a spreadsheet. Say, I spoke to this person and I know they're a part of this organization, other potential places that they might know. There you have it. So you're starting with that. Number two, number two is make hot leads a priority. So if you get somebody who does respond to jump on it. I mean, they're not going to wait until your inbox clears off. If that introduction was hot, two days at most, okay? Biggest mistake of my career was not chasing leads soon enough. You know, I still can cringe when I think of all the people who approached me after I gave a program. They either asked for my card or they, you know, I promised a call to schedule uh, a meeting with them and maybe I never did. And I would leave meetings thinking I had like a dozen leads and sometimes more than that from when I had a live audience. I would put an evaluation in the seat. I would make it fluorescent colored so I could see easily from the stage or up front wherever I was standing if they had handed that in or not. And I would ask the meeting planners to, hey, would you help round those up if I didn't have any staff? And most of the time it didn't, it was just me. Would you hand all of those to your right? And then I would walk down and pick those up. And I could see easily if somebody was still holding one in their hand and they hadn't turned it in, 
I would, again, say, hey, you know, here it is. And I would hold one up so that they would turn it in and I would make it super short. But on those sheets, I would say, you know, what was the biggest takeaway? What are you going to implement first? What was the biggest aha moment for you? And then I would say, you know, if you'd like to connect further, uh, please put your best contact information, phone number and email places for that. And and then I left boxes to check. Would you like uh, Deborah's newsletter? At the time, I thought that was a good idea. Everybody else did too, right? Newsletters, but not so much probably. If you'd like my free e-guide, that would probably be a better way to do it. So you could actually drop them into your email list on that e-guide Uh, funnel and smarter way to operate today. Would you like a phone call about just how you could work, how we could work together and do some private coaching? Uh, Would you like a phone call about our programs and a description of this or this and how they would fit you? So I gave them options and they were basically inviting me to connect about how we work together. But some of those I would go home and then I was overwhelmed and I had to catch up with two or three days of work before I got to it. And then it was like, they kind of gone cold and I didn't get back to them. That's pathetic. I've got desk drawers full or did. I've moved a couple of times. I had desk drawers full of rubber banded business cards when everybody did that instead of sharing their phones and switching information which actually I find a lot easier to track. This is somebody new I need to contact if it's a business card, but I don't even make business cards anymore. I haven't for, gosh, probably 10 years. But you know, if you don't follow up on those right away, you're kind of telling them how you do business. Yeah, it's not a hot priority. So very important that you do that. So then, you know, at the time I started doing this, texting was like a big deal and people didn't text. They didn't all have access to it. But today I would definitely text. So if you send somebody an email, it's the first time you've sent them an email, it's probably going to spam trash for their promotional folder and they will never, ever see it. A really good chance. So instead I would actually text them also and say, Hey, I just sent you an email from and then put my address. So they go looking for your address. Don't just say I sent you an email because if it is something that they would never figure out, you know, it's not your first name. It's not the title of the speech you just gave to them. Why would they ever find that? So make sure you say, yep, just followed up from this address. Go look for it. Um, after you've sent that email. Number three, plan your calls ahead of time. So if you are going to be making follow-up calls, have notes and necessary tools in front of you. Don't wing it, right? So yes, a script is really helpful, but if you're calling somebody who is, uh, say the meeting planner said, yeah, call me, you know, or the decision maker who might bring you in to put you in front of a group says, yeah, I'd love a quick consultation so we can learn and identify really what it is that you do and, and whether we're a great match for each other, then look them up do a little homework about them, look them up on LinkedIn, look up some of their social media accounts, anything where you can find out some more information. You know, the goal is to get in front of audience of anything, 25, 100, or 1,000 who are ideal customers. So remember that's important. If you get in front of a corporation that is mostly male and they're doing something and that's not who you serve, that's a waste of time for you and for them. I mean, would you take their money if they wanted to work with you? Probably. But if you've identified that's not your dream or ideal customer, I would not go down that path, even if you're starving. There's plenty of audiences and abundance of them who are people you want to work with. Number four, research that contact person. So I really kind of overlapped here. I've already jumped the gun (laughs) in terms of, yes, have a have a script in front of you, but here too, go into LinkedIn, look for them, know that contact person, especially if you're calling a company. But if you are calling somebody who is the head of a small business, I mean, if they have a podcast, you know, listen to an episode or two, go to their website. What do they say about themselves on their about page? Know those things. But then, hello, you don't jump on the call and say, hey, I've done my research and this is what I found out about you. 
no, no, no. You just see, are there some common denominators so that you could say, to somebody who you realize is actually from the Midwest and you bring up that you are from the Midwest as well, because then it's relevant, even if now you're not living in the Midwest, right? Otherwise that should never probably creep into your phone call. And, um, you wouldn't know that if you've been, you know, just under a rock and you just call them cold. So, do a little research. You'll just feel better. You know, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, a Google search and their company website, if that's appropriate, all those places, you know, don't, don't pretend. One of the things that I've hated about people who contact me to be guests on my podcast, whether it's them or it's a PR agency reaching out on their behalf, they will appropriately say, Hey, we love what you're doing. We love what you're posting in the content and how you're helping midlife women. But that's really all they've done is know that I'm doing that. They, I can tell they have not listened to a uh, podcast or done a search on the site for podcasts that I might've already done on the topic that they want to talk on. Now there's a good chance if we've talked about a topic, we're going to talk about it again. I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years. Of course, we're going to revisit certain topics, especially the most popular ones. But if somebody is bluffing, I can tell it. I can just, it feels icky. It feels like you are now trying to sell your way in, be my best friend. And you really haven't you'd have no clue like what, what we are and what our brand does talk about and doesn't talk about. So don't, you know, pretend if you haven't done that research that you know them. Okay. Number five, joining several organizations that serve your audience is a great idea, but this is not what you think. So often Think about the networks or associations you belong to right now. If you're a health and fitness professional, my bet is the majority of them are health certifications, coaching certifications. You belong to the membership of that agency. Sometimes it's a sister organization. And you know that's not enough because what you're doing is putting yourself in a mix of people exactly like you, right? So you instead, if you want to serve midlife women, you got to think about what kind of midlife women because they're not all the same, right? So is it women in business? Then there are tons of women in business organizations. Potentially, you should join one of them. Do you specifically serve midlife women who are nurses or in health care themselves, taking terrible care of themselves, who need help with that accountability? You might want to then join organizations and or go to conferences that serve those people. So think deeply about where your customer is. Where do they go? We all go on vacation, but you're probably going to randomly find someone on vacation, right? That's in your group. You, we all go to continuing education. Now, some of us don't go anymore, but we're getting back to that, right? So consider joining so that you can be in those groups. You might consider um, attending Ursa instead of attending the Personal Training Institute or the Health Coaching uh, Conference. And the reason being that at Ursa, which is, if you're not familiar, it's the Racket and Health Sports Association International um, Group, but you're going to run into business owners, developers, managers, directors. Could they bring you in for your their staff? training based on what you're doing. Um, you're going to run into health club owners that may think I need what I need what you're offering and maybe want to bring you in again to train more on a meta level or to offer workshops with their people. That would be a potentially one step up, but then there's the outside of our actual industry and inside of who your ideal customer is. If you work with female business owners who are realtors or financial planners, they have associations, they have groups and organizations you may want to consider joining. Number six is when you travel, check out the hotel marquee boards. 
So you may be traveling either for vacation or you may be at a conference yourself. So you know how they, today's schedule, you know, is somewhere near the lobby or uh, near the elevators. Look at those. I mean, who is there at the moment? And, you know, if you live in a big enough city where there are conferences hosted regularly, you know, I would certainly approach the person at the hotel who's in charge of booking meetings, that conference planner, the liaison. I don't know what their title is. They probably have other roles depending on the size of the city. But this is an important place to look at who's here and who might I contact. Like look at the association name, who's having a conference, and um, consider finding out like who's the leader. Maybe you run into them there, but listen, they're probably going to be really busy. But you contact them later. You start getting ideas like – Okay. And this is a little stereotypical. So this is kind of from back in the day, 15, 20, 25, even 30 years ago. This is when I was still married that my my husband was in financial planning and um, he did really well. So we did a lot of traveling to, you know, places like Maui and Madrid, Spain and Munich, Germany. And, you know, Every time we were there with the majority of, not all, but the majority of the the guys who were the financial planner, and literally I just gave it away, guys, they were men, you know, at that point. Less so now, I believe, but usually that left a lot of wives while the husbands were in meetings, like what were the wives doing, right? So sometimes there was activities and sometimes there was just, we had free time and we were hanging at the pool or doing our own thing and then meeting up with them afterward for dinner or to do another activity. But you want to pay attention to that and whether there's opportunities for you to say, hey, what if we offered for the ladies in the group a special yoga retreat half day? Or we offered for them, you know, a special, you know, hormone balancing exercise session, you know, depending. So it's got to be age appropriate if you're going to do that. But is there something you could offer on a broader level to help and support someone or take them on a hike and a tour so they don't get lost and they know, you know, pacing themselves and somebody's bringing along water or whatever, but there are opportunities most likely. So consider this. So currently, if a hotel or resort has a fitness studio and a gym, you know, the people who are coming back in and using that just like they would um, anytime fitness or lifetime fitness and joining it, I mean, they're for residents of the community. People can actually do that. And, you know, sometimes there are townhomes, condominiums right there at resorts because they're long-term stays and or maybe round all year round stays. So they're actually residents who stay there and live there and they can join or already get access to it. But others can too if they're not at capacity. But people are not quite back and filling in yet. And everybody's still, I don't know, are we, are we, you know, out of our risk? Um so there's a lot of empty space. And whenever there's square footage that is empty space, they would love to make money by filling it. So, you know, consider that they are renting studio space out. You could host a workshop and you could charge, you know, what, two hours, three hours, two and a half hours, you could charge a hundred to $200 for it. You, during that workshop, you do an upsell to a program that would be, here's a continuity program we can do with outside of this via, you know, virtual, but say you had 20 people and you filled that space, 20 people, even if you charge the lowest, you charge a hundred bucks per person. How much is that? That's, that's a pretty good rate, right? So you made 2000 just for a few hours work, probably doing something you could do blindfolded and backwards. And then let's say you sold 40% of them into a program that was $1,000 each. Uh, and 
eight people bought that. That's a 40% conversion rate. And that's, you need to be there. <laughs> By the way, if you're not there, that's, uh, you know, 8,000 more. So that's a $10,000 day. What if you did that a few times a year? I mean, how much would 40,000 more dollars to your bottom line support you? And you do one in the spring. You do a summer, summer training. You do a fall, you know, back in action. You do a winter survival guide, stress-free, whatever, right? Great ideas for you there, packed in, but don't stop with a good idea. Good ideas are just confusing, actually, unless you narrow it down and say, you know, that is, this is one action I am going to act on. So if that's a good idea, write it down, put it on your calendar. When are you going to act on it? So invitations is number seven, invitations to sample. So a lot of times somebody needs to sample what it is you do. If they're undecided about hiring, you invite them to attend a group session or just allow them access to your membership or to your program. Right now I have a group of functional doctors. I'm starting a group for them to answer questions that they have so that they can better serve their patients. So again, we talked about this at the beginning Functional doctors don't have any business really prescribing exercise to each and every individual patient, nor do they have time. They take a whole lot more time with someone that a conventional doctor does, but they can't get into it really deeply. So I actually... I am putting together a beta group for, you know, it's maximum 10 people. And so I've got somebody on the fence, so I'm talking to her tomorrow. So I'm going to actually put her into the membership and say, these are the things that we offer, and this is what you would get if we white glove you into this beta group and how I would serve you in serving your patients so that they get exactly what they need, making it very, very clear. So make the effort to make the guest who's in a group feels special. Now, obviously, you know, when it's a virtual like this, so I can't uh, leave a special note on a seat or put a water bottle under their seat or, you know, make them feel extremely warm and welcome when they come in the door. But what I can do is reach out to them and say, you know, how did your first couple of workouts go? First couple of times are the roughest. I can send a quick video and say, when you get inside, here's exactly where you're going to go. You're going to go to the exercise tab and I want you to use these and choose this one. Here's the link. You'll just have to be logged in in order for this to work. So it's like white glove service and you really help them and follow up with them. Those things are seven, let's review those, seven ways to get booked as a speaker. So number one, just to refresh, okay, was start that circle of 100 by getting 25 people on their names on a list and know exactly how they're connected to somebody that is your ideal audience. Number two is make hot leads a priority. If you get them at all, follow up within the next couple of days. Number three is plan your calls ahead of time. So have all the notes, have a script in front of you. Now, whether it was me or starting consultations first for doing it myself, or it was training somebody else to make those calls for me, here's here's where you're going to go wrong when you have a consultation. You're going to diarrhea and vomit out ways that you help, answers to their questions. That's not what a consultation is about. Think of it as a better said discovery call. They're discovering which program or package is the way that they'll move forward with you. All you're talking to them about is their problem, how long it's been a problem, how much it bothers them, how often do you think about this problem, and say, how serious are you about getting started? You've screened them with that ideally before they come in. Then on the call, you screen them again, and you say... At this call, what we're doing, the purpose of this call is um, so that we can make a decision about how to move forward together. So here's how this usually goes. I will ask you some questions. We just want to confirm and really dive into what are the things that are most important to you and unpack that. I will offer a couple of solutions based on what you've said, and then we will together decide uh, if there's uh, any other thing that we need to pull in here to make that work or 
uh, pull out so that it does work for you. How does that sound for you? Then you're just asking permission. That's what you're doing on a call. You're not actually saying, sure, sure, I will give you, you know, several answers to what you should be doing this week, how to change your exercise. No, that's not a consultation, my friend. You're just giving free time away. And we don't have time to do that. Okay. Similarly, if you're doing a consultation at a gym, right, that's really important. Number four is research that person, the individual, LinkedIn, Google, YouTube. Number five was join organizations that serve your audience, your ideal client. Number six is use hotel marquee boards. Sometimes they're outside, but rarely. You're usually there in the hotel lobbies and visit local resorts. Number seven, give them invitations to sample what it is that you do or that you would do for their constituents, whether it's their staff members or their clients, if you're training someone on a meta level. So there you have it. If you have questions, what I would love is for you to leave comments or questions below the show link at fitnessmarketingmastery.com forward slash get booked as a speaker. And what are you waiting for? Let's start being the ones that get women feeling more confident in the way that they can change the way that they age. 